Welcome to our study this week of Psalm chapter 118, verses 14 to 29. My name is Scott Rainey. I serve with the Church of the Nazarene in the area of Nazarene Discipleship International, or NDI. This adult Sunday school video lesson is provided in collaboration between the Foundry Publishing and NDI. The Sunday school lesson is intended to support the local church's efforts to make disciples who make disciples. Please feel free to use this video in any way that helps your church or its families. This Sunday, April 10, 2022, is the Western Church's celebration of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the start of Holy Week. It represents the entrance of Jesus into the holy city of Jerusalem just five days before he was crucified on Good Friday. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, describe the events of that day. The disciples brought a donkey and a colt for Jesus to sit on. A large crowd had gathered to welcome Jesus. The crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees. Our tradition says palm trees, uh, and thus Palm Sunday, and spread them on the road. The crowd shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. It was the welcome of the long-awaited Messiah, King of Israel, Son of God. We have all seen this scene in churches through the years, acted out by children in our sanctuaries. The words of the crowd on the day Jesus entered Jerusalem, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, actually quote Psalm 118, verse 26. Psalm 118 was a familiar psalm in the ancient Jewish tradition. This psalm concluded what is known as the Hallel, or the praise psalms, here hallelujah, which are Psalms 113 to 118. These psalms were recited during the Passover celebration, commemorating God's deliverance of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Psalm 118 would have been the final psalm sung at the Passover meal. To quote it as Jesus entered Jerusalem was quite significant. The crowd was claiming that Yahweh's Messiah had arrived in Jesus of Nazareth. They had hoped that Jesus would soon deliver them from the Romans in the same way that God had delivered Israel years ago from Egypt. The psalm celebrates the victory of the Lord in this world. It invites worshipers to join in triumphal procession to the Jerusalem temple, praising God for salvation. What a psalm for us to study this week. The psalm is calling you and me to join the triumphal procession too, to praise God for his salvation. We, as disciples of Jesus today, understand in a very clear way that Jesus fulfilled this psalm as the coming king who had victory over the final enemy, death itself. The first 13 verses of Psalm 118 are the testimony of a warrior returning from, the victor from a victorious battle. The words of the rest of the psalm, that is verses 14 to 29, have movement from the battlefield through the gates of the temple to the altar. If you are willing to go on this same journey together, I believe your Palm Sunday will be filled with praise to our conquering king, Jesus. So let's pick up with verse 14. That is Psalm 118, verses 14 to 29. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. 
The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous, and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it to uh, this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal uh, procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. As we go through this passage, I want us to consider four parallel stories. First, the story of the psalmist's procession to the temple celebrating God's victory over his enemies. That's the clear one in Psalm 118. Second, the story of the Israelites' procession across the Red Sea celebrating God's deliverance from Egyptian slavery. Third, the story of Jesus Christ's procession on Palm Sunday toward his ultimate sacrificial death and resurrection to deliver God's people from sin. And finally, number four, your procession to your local church this Sunday to celebrate how Christ's death and resurrection has brought salvation to you. The first movement in the story is the kings returning from battle. As we start in verse 14, the speaker appears to be the king of Israel, whom God has delivered from his enemies. He is just returning from the battle. Victory has been won. The king's words are personal. The Lord is my strength and my defense, my salvation. Verse 14. These words of Psalm 118, verse 14, are a perfect quote from Exodus chapter 15, verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. They were words from the song of Moses and Miriam as soon as the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea. God had just given salvation and deliverance to the Israelites from the Egyptians. It was time to praise God for his victory. God had given strength to overcome, protection from the enemies, and ultimately deliverance and freedom. The king of Psalm 118 had experienced this salvation. The Israelites of Exodus 15 had experienced it as well. And God promises the same for you and me today. He is our strength, our defense, and our salvation. Following the battle, it appears that the king and his fellow warriors had gathered in their tents to celebrate. Verse 15 says, shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. As they divided the plunder, they shouted with joy over God's victory. Their words of praise were, the Lord's right hand has done mighty things, verses 15 and 16. In the ancient world, a king's right hand symbolized power. Certainly, God's right hand was the most powerful. Once again, these words seem to come from Moses and Miriam's song of Exodus 15, this time in verse 6, where it says, Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. How many of us today can speak of God's power to save. His right hand is majestic in power. No amount of sin can keep God from a repentant sinner. You 
or anyone you know is not too far for God's right hand to reach them in salvation. In verses 17 and 18, the king recalls how God had saved him from death. He was surrounded by his enemies, but God intervened and rescued him. In praise, the king promises in Psalm 118, verse 17, to proclaim what God has done for the rest of his life. I'm reminded of the song, I Love to Tell the Story by William Fisher. In verse three, it says, I love to tell the story. Tis pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. We know the good old story of Jesus. Jesus was chastened severely, chastened severely by Roman soldiers and killed. And unlike the king of Psalm 118, Jesus was in fact given over to death. Death, however, did not have the final word. Three days later, God raised Jesus from the grave, conquering once and for all Satan, sin, and death. The church where my family attends today has a tradition of placing Easter lilies all over the platform in the sanctuary. The congregation is invited to help pay for the Easter lilies by purchasing one of them in memory of someone you love who has passed away. It's interesting and telling to me that we would celebrate the resurrection of Jesus by remembering someone who has died. Think about it for a moment. The resurrection of Jesus is a promise to those who believe in him. It's a promise that death does not have the final word for Jesus uh, or for you and for me. Death has lost its victory. It has lost its sting. So to remember a loved one on Easter who's passed is to help us focus on the hope of the resurrection. As we move into verse 19 of Psalm 118, we've moved from the battlefield to the gates of the temple. The king calls for the gates of the temple to be open for him and for the righteous. The purpose of entry was to give thanks to the Lord, verse 19. The righteous, in verse 19, represent those who live in a right relationship with God by keeping his covenant laws and maintaining a life of devotion and faithfulness. For believers today, the righteous represent those who live in a right relationship with God through the blood of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verses 22 to 24 appear to be the response of the people who've joined the king in entering the temple. Remember, in the king's day, these people are praising God for victory in battle over their enemies. Their opening declaration speaks of a reversal of fortunes for the nation of Israel. They say, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes, verses 22 and 23. The nation of Israel, you see, had been rejected and despised by others, but now they had become the object of God's favor and salvation, the cornerstone of the building. In the national history of Israel, deliverance from both Egypt and Babylon were reversal of fortunes brought about by God. The worshiping community of the psalmist day recognized in their present history a repeat of God's almighty act of salvation. Early Christians following the death and resurrection of Jesus identified the cornerstone of Psalm 118 verse 22 with Jesus the Messiah, who was rejected by Israel's religious leaders, but exalted by God. When we, heard, when we hear the word cornerstone today, most of us think of a modern cornerstone. Today, when a building is being constructed, the builders will often put key items from the present in a box-like stone 
that's placed near the corner of a building. This stone is like a time capsule, and it often is referred to as a cornerstone. This modern kind of cornerstone is of little help in understanding what the biblical authors meant. The word cornerstone in the Bible, according to the New International Version of the Bible, is used 12 times. Five of those times are in the Old Testament. Seven of those occurrences are in the New Testament, quoting Psalm 118 and Isaiah 28. All seven times that cornerstone is used in the New Testament are making reference to Jesus Christ. The Greek word for cornerstone refers to the primary foundation stone at the corner of a building, which determines how all the remaining parts are built together. When Jesus conquered death, he became the foundation upon which God established his kingdom. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, the apostle Paul said, in him, Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. For the Israelites, the reversal of fortunes was from a nation rejected to being the people of the one true God. For Jesus, the reversal of fortunes was from being rejected by the Jewish leaders to being exalted by God. Are you able to describe your reversal of fortunes? I've heard some say that they went from being tangled in sin to being set free in Christ. Others say that they've gone from lost to found or hopeless to full of hope. Others say that they went from being self-centered to being fully committed follower of Jesus. The victory that is available by God through Christ is complete you are invited to enter the gates of the temple to worship him. As we enter the temple in verses 25 to 29, we find the procession of the king and the people is headed straight for the altar. There, the offerings of thanksgiving and sacrifice for sin could be made. Their request was that God would save them from future calamities and troubles. The people sought God's continued favor and blessings. Psalm 118, verse 25 says, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. The Hebrew word, Hosanna, means save us. Hosanna is followed in Psalm 118 with the words of verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This verse is a blessing and welcome addressed to the king and the worshiping community by the officiating priests. The community enters the temple, trusting not in their own righteousness, but in God, who is the source of their salvation. Verse 24, remember, said, the Lord has done it this very day. The priests Affirm Israel's cardinal doctrine that Yahweh alone is God in verse 27. You might remember Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The priests go on to declare that the Lord has made his light shine on us, verse 27. This sounds like the priest's blessing in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. Six, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. From there, the congregation goes to the altar. In Israel's sacrificial system, according to Leviticus chapter 9, verse 9, the blood of the sin offering was smeared on the horns of the altar for forgiveness of sins. This ritual of thanksgiving included the offering of a sacrifice. Psalm 118, verse 29, ends the psalm with the words, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We must not forget the altar of sacrifice was also Jesus' destination on Palm Sunday. Within a few days, 
Jesus would lay down his life for the sins of the world, not on the temple altar, but just outside the city gate. Three days later, Jesus would rise again to live forever, the firstborn among the dead. From that point on, his people would give thanks to the Lord for God's amazing, enduring love on a cross. No wonder this psalm ends with thanksgiving. Christians through the centuries have offered thanks during a very special meal, which remembers Christ's work on the cross. This meal is known as the Eucharist. The word means thanksgiving. So this Palm Sunday, let's celebrate the victory and salvation God has given to us in Jesus' death and resurrection. Let's enter the sanctuary with praise and move toward the altar of sacrifice that is sprinkled with the precious blood of Jesus, our Lord. Let's be thankful for his wonderful gift of life. And let's allow Jesus to join us all together in him as his church.